Wayne Gretzky makes his October 6th, 1988, Los Angeles. Tickets are sold out. It's the first home of Alan Thicke is on his way to see Wayne Gretzky and the LA Kings make history. The Kings are looking for a win tonight. It's a beautiful 32 degrees and life couldn't be better for a Canadian in California. Thick is the star of the popular TV series, Growing Pains. He's a long way from his native Kirkland Lake, Ontario, but he considers himself Canada's unofficial hockey ambassador in Los Angeles. Now that his friend Wayne's in town, Thick, Gretzky, and King's owner Bruce McNall become the darlings of Hollywood. There was a buzz and the town was excited. This is a star-driven town even in the world of sports. So they understood Wayne Gretzky on a celebrity level, if not a hockey level. To Gretzky! And he scores! It's the first game goal of the new season. Importing Canada's biggest star is just the beginning of hockey's new push into the American Sun Belt. But while the NHL expands down south, it leaves trouble behind up north. Two Canadian teams will die, and others will struggle to survive. Hockey will be tarnished by scandal. It will take the efforts of some new hockey heroes to make Canada feel good again. Canadian poet Al Purdy once called hockey a combination of ballet and murder. Muscular, graceful, brute strength matched with careful precision. To fans of the game, it's athleticism in its purest form. So when Fox TV introduces the Fox Tracks puck in the mid 90s, to help rookie American viewers follow the action, Canadian fans are offended. I've never had a problem. I don't know what they're doing down in the States, why they can't see it. Baseball goes at 95 miles an hour when the pitcher pitches. The Americans don't have a problem following that. It leaves at about 150 miles an hour off the bat. I don't know what problem they got following the puck then. The new American teams are quick with other gimmicks too. Disney calls its team the Mighty Ducks and markets it like one of its cartoons. It's a quack heard around the world. One, two, three. Tampa Bay Lightning does one better, putting a Canadian woman, Manon Réaume, in goal for an exhibition game. General Manager Phil Esposito doesn't care if she's a woman. He says if he could find a horse with skates that could stop a puck, he'd put it in net. His ploy works. The first woman ever to play in the NHL makes it onto Letterman. I always play because I love hockey. Hockey for me is a passion. Hockey for me is a passion. Say, <laughs> say that again. Just, just say that part again. Hockey for me is a passion. Oh. Back in LA, Gretzky's playing with the passion of a rookie, filling the house night after night. The movie stars were going to the game. Ronald Reagan was going to the game. The 
And when did that ever happen to hockey? That time was, I think, a great, great time for hockey to make steps, positive steps in the United States. While Gretzky is wowing them in Tinseltown, Mario Lemieux, Canada's other great star, is doing the same in an Eastern American city, Pittsburgh. Since he was drafted by the Penguins as a teenager, Lemieux has transformed a city which had begun to go sour on hockey. When Mario Lemieux signs with the Penguins, he's coming to a franchise that is desperate. It's playing in a city in a rink called the Igloo, which is cold and lonely. Only the Penguins are there, it seems. Um, fans are not coming. But the Penguins will be noticed if he succeeds. And he knows that, and they know that. Mario Lemieux grew up in ville mar a working-class area of Montreal. Even as a kid, it was clear he had something special. His coach, Ron Stevenson, remembers Mario as a brilliant, tenacious 12-year-old. Some games, he would appear completely and absolutely exhausted. Yet somehow, he would get the strength for one last rush to score the tying goal, or the winning goal. His standout talent often made him a target for hostile parents from opposing teams. The problem, especially in the peewee, was the adults. Adults in the stands. He'd come off the ice and women would spit at him. Adults would push at him. So a lot of times when we played, not in Villamar, but in other games in the league, if Mario wanted to go off and get a soft drink, we would have to send other team members with him. But Mario never missed a game. By the time he's in Pittsburgh, he's learned to play through everything. Here's Lemieux. Including back injuries so severe, he can't even lace his own skates. Look at Lemieux! Oh my heavens! What a goal! What a goal! Lemieux! Pittsburgh, which has seen its own share of troubles, falls in love. Mario returns the affection by leading the Penguins to two consecutive Stanley Cups. And he helps inspire a generation of American kids. One of them is Ryan Malone. He's 13 when the Penguins win their first cup. He has his photo taken with his hero. There was only one rink to play on when I was growing up. It was winning the cup in 91 and 92 that made the difference here. Mario got everyone involved. If it seems too good to be true, it is. We as an organization, and I personally, have only one concern, and that is for 100% recovery for Mario. This is not about hockey. This is about a very precious human being who is going to recover. In 1993, at the age of 27, Lemieux is diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease a potentially fatal form of cancer. He undergoes four weeks of punishing radiation. And on the last day of treatment, he leaves the hospital to fly straight to a road game. He scores a goal that night and almost unbelievably goes on to win the NHL scoring championship. When, when we look at athletes sometimes, we forget about the human side of things. For him to be able to still get on the ice and compete, to come back from what he did with them in the Art Ross, I mean, I don't think there's, well, words can't even describe it. I'd be doing it in, in justice. For Ryan Malone, now 15, Lemieux's spectacular comeback is inspiring. He scores! Ryan Malone on Ryan Malone's night gets the game. Eight years later, Ryan will become the first Pittsburgh native to play on the home team Penguins. 
Look at the kids. Ryan Malone looking back in time at all those little kids that wearing those hockey jerseys. He was one of them once. I had only hoped to play junior hockey someday. It never occurred to me I could play pro. I could never have done it without Mario's example. But as hockey spreads its wings in the United States, in Canada, the game is in trouble. For Canadians, young and old, hockey is a way of saying who they are and which part of the country they come from. Attachment to local teams is like a family bond. Especially in communities like Winnipeg, where hockey has been bred in the bone for over a hundred years. The arrival of the CPR in the late 1800s brought to Winnipeg's hockey teams the first of three Stanley Cups. In 1920, the Winnipeg Falcons won the first Olympic gold medal ever awarded in hockey. And since the arrival of Winnipeg's first major league team in the early 70s, arenas have been packed with passionate Jets fans like Mark Olson. We've had season tickets in the family for ages. I've been watching the Jets since the WHA and Bobby Hull. Even if you're not into hockey, you're drawn into it in Winnipeg. But by 1995, the realities of professional hockey are hitting teams like Winnipeg hard. Player salaries have risen 350% since the Gretzky trade, and players are now paid in surging U.S. currency. Mark Olson is in the Winnipeg arena after the Jets owner breaks the devastating news that the team is up for sale. A letter to a Winnipeg newspaper expresses what Olson and many other fans feel. It wasn't just about hockey. It was about experiencing something that made us feel exhilarated as a community or down as a community. We live in a time where we're prone to feeling a little awkward at the simple task of saying hello to our neighbors. Yet we have no problem high-fiving someone at a hockey game or weeping with them in the last moments of an era we couldn't believe was really ending. Mark Olson has brought his family. I've got three kids, six, eight, and nine. We're doing the wave, and one of the kids looks up and says, Dad, I just can't stop crying. Winnipeggers decide to do something about it. Tonight, it's the Save the Jets social, starting at 7 p.m. at the Winnipeg Convention Center. Jets players... Mark Olson, his wife, and a friend pull three all-nighters putting together what Winnipeggers call a social. We had 2,000 people come in the end. We ended up making a quarter of a million dollars. This is my way of doing what I can to save the Jets. There are many events like it, as fans pitch in to save their team. Operation Grassroots is now headed into the home stretch, and the response has been overwhelming. That's what we're about here in Winnipeg. 35,000 Manitobans turn out for a fundraising rally, the largest crowd ever assembled in Winnipeg. In the end, fans raise an astounding $13 million. Thank you. It's not enough. Smile. The Jets meet quietly for their last team photo. They'll be moving to Arizona to become the Phoenix Coyotes. The heroic efforts to save them have come to nothing. The $13 million is donated to Winnipeg Charities. Voici Simon. Simon. Ça va derrière le but. Reviens devant le tir. 
In Quebec City, Nordique's fans have also cheered on their team through tough economic times. But in 1995, as the team is poised for a breakthrough, owner Marcel Obu pulls the plug. The new exigences of the industry of hockey, the taille du marché de Québec, and the absence of a governmental adequate sound the dollar of the Nordic à Québec. Fans had been loyal even through the lean years. Now they're disappointed and bitter. Non, aujourd'hui, c'est très, très triste. Marcel Aubu, fout le camp. Nous autres, on était là pour te supporter. Et puis, tu l'as pas apprécié. Puis le monde de Québec a plaide aujourd'hui. In May of 95, the Nordiques are sold and moved to Denver. And heartbreak of heartbreaks, the newly christened Colorado Avalanche wins the cup in its first season. In the space of a year, two Canadian cities are crushed. In Winnipeg, they bled. They bled real blood, and they bled in Quebec City. I think we like to pretend that it was a Canadian-controlled game, but it's been run by Americans forever. And when the teams left Canada for the United States, it was just a confirmation. That's where the money was. If, if you erase that border, you know, you're going to be drawn magnetically to the money, to the marketplace. And... Uh, those teams were magnetically drawn out of Canada. Other Canadian communities are also struggling to keep their teams in the 1990s. Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver. The resurrected Ottawa Senators flirt with bankruptcy from the day the puck drops. And even established teams in Toronto and Montreal are forced to raise ticket prices and build bigger arenas. For long-time Canadians fans, like Romeo Paré, the new economics of the game are all about loss. Paré is leaving his house near Trois-Rivières to say goodbye to an old friend, the Montreal Forum. One of hockey's most hallowed temples is closing down. Paré has been going to see the Canadians play there for over 60 years, since he went as a small boy with his father. The old forum was like a hockey shrine for me. It was the place where our national heroes, our hockey star Maurice Richard, became what he was, where he made us all feel so alive during a time when it was the sport that mattered, not money. Now, in the last and saddest ceremony on Forum Ice, fans bid farewell to their Hall of Heroes. I saw Maurice Richard. He seemed sad. I think he was also getting sick by that time, too. I introduced myself and said, so, it's the end of an era. But I didn't want to get into it too much because uh, I know that he's a sensitive guy. A parade transfers the ghosts of the Forum to the new arena. At the Molson Center, fabled Millionaire's Row, where fans could buy cheap tickets and stand to watch the game, is replaced by luxury boxes for real millionaires. The era of the ordinary guy, player or fan, seems over. Three years later, Canada's other great hockey shrine, Maple Leaf Gardens, closes its doors. After 70 years, the grand old lady of Carlton Street will be replaced by another new arena, 
and more corporate boxes. To players and fans alike, a bit of the Canadian soul has been lost for good. I can remember standing down by the boards and, and watching new rookies in from the West, and they would be warming up with their teams and trying to be Joe Cool, you know, but they're looking around. And now, hey, I'm in the Montreal Forum. Hey, I'm in Maple Leaf Gardens, Toronto. This, they, you know, this is really something in, in their lives. This was a big moment. They were in those buildings. We have a thing in Canada about buildings. It's, it's great. I've always thought the three most famous buildings in Canada at one time were Parliament Buildings in Ottawa, the Gardens, and the Forum. <laughs> Still another Canadian touchstone, our venerable hockey equipment makers, is threatened by the new economic realities. Cambridge in southwestern Ontario has been a center of hockey manufacturing for more than a century. The Hespeler Hockey Stick Company opened here in 1905. Over the years, countless kids and their heroes have played with the legendary stick. And with their Hespelers in hand, they skated on Bauer skates. Lee Martin was one of them. She even went to work at the Bauer skate plant. There's a big hockey tradition in Cambridge. And everyone here is proud of that. But with hockey growing in popularity in the United States, Sports giant Nike gets in on the action. It buys the Bauer skate plant and the Hespler hockey stick factory and throws a party for the workers. After four years of Nike ownership, the workers get together again. But this time, it's to console each other. The regional head called us all into the finishing room. He said the plant was closing and that we had one more year here, and that was it. I felt sick to my stomach. All of us felt the same way. Most of the jobs of Martin and her co-workers are transferred to Asia. As for the Hespeler hockey stick factory, it's only saved because the workers themselves will pool their money and buy it. And as it and other Canadian icons struggle to stay alive, the game itself is about to be rocked to its foundations. And Gordie Howe has it, number nine. Gordie Howe, number nine. Keeps it out to center right. Gordie Howe, dazzling star of the Detroit Red Wings, sets a lot of records during his NHL career. I'll get some hands back, get the side, score! One of them for playing an amazing 26 years. But when he finally retired in 1980, he learned his pension after all those years of service was just $13,000 a year. His response will help set in motion a radical shakeup of hockey's establishment in the 1990s. Carl Brewer is the spark plug. The former Maple Leafs defenseman has long been suspicious about players' pensions. Now he teams up with Howe and other retired players, including Bobby Hull. They decide to sue the league. And if they're expecting that Alan Eagleson, the powerful head of the players' union, will back them up, they're in for a surprise. All of these complaints come from a group of losers and a bunch of moaners who had the opportunity at the time to ask questions and do things. Most of the ones who are doing the complaining haven't even worked for the past 10 or 15 years. No one symbolizes the hockey establishment quite like Alan Eagleson. Head of the NHL Players Association for more than 20 years, friend to NHL management and organizer of international hockey tournaments, Eagleson received the Order of Canada for his services to the game. But in the early 90s, the players are beginning to face the truth about the powerful Eagleson. He's been using his conflicting connections to help the league 
cheat them. He's conflicted in every way. He'll represent the player, he'll talk to the, he'll be a pal with the owner, and he'll run the union. He's like, it's like one-stop shopping. And there wasn't anybody at that stage of the NHL's evolution who was going to call Al's bluff. It's a small world, and your well-being, your, your career, your income, your pension, it's all hanging in the balance. You're going to have a lot of guts to stand up in, in, in that kind of a circumstance. Carl Brewer was never short on courage, and he was always a bit of a scrapper. He and the other retired players, now seven of them in all, put everything they have on the line when they take the league to court. For 50 years, they've been able to dodge questions from their dumb players, says Brewer. But this is one group, folks, who won't go away. The players win. The league is forced to repay over $40 million to the pension fund. And the players aren't the only ones asking questions about the league and Alan Eagleson. A small New England newspaper and its reporter, Russ Conway, publish an expose that sparks an FBI investigation. Eagleson wasn't telling the truth. He once told... Bruce Dobigan is the lone Canadian journalist who dares to follow up on Conway's stories. CBC was unable to find any player rep from the... But everywhere, people tell him to drop it. I was like everyone else. I mean, if I can say this, I was scared shitless by Alan Eagleson. I was impressed by him. I kept thinking, well, who am I to do this? You know, why isn't anyone else doing this? Someone else does. Ex-Boston Bruin Mike Gillis and his wife Diane decide to take a stand against the powerful Eagleson. Mike's career had ended in 1984 with a broken leg. Eagleson, as his agent, told him he'd have to pay $41,000 for extra legal help to get his disability claim accepted by the insurers. Now the Gillises wonder if that was true. Packed away in their basement are old insurance files from Mike's days as Eagleson's client. Diane looked through them, and we found that our claim had in fact been approved. And we were told by Alan that it hadn't been approved and that we had to hire lawyers in London and New York. Diane finds a canceled check that reveals their $41,000, rather than paying lawyers' fees, went into one of Eagleson's own holding companies. It seems that Eagleson had defrauded his own injured client. I remember bringing the check up and sitting right in the dining room and figuring out, okay, so what are we going to do about it? The Gillises decide to sue. We've cooperated with everybody, but I just feel like I'm being snuck up on her. It's just not mannered. The strain of seven weeks in court is showing on Alan Eagleson. When their case gets to court in 1996, Bruce Dobigan is there. The Gillis case is one of several legal hurdles facing Eagleson at the moment. He is under an arrest warrant in the United States. He's in the courtroom when Eagleson testifies. When I saw him on the stand under oath, I realized that he had no good answers. He sounded like a schoolboy trying to explain why he didn't have his homework. The excuses were lame. The attempt to endear himself to the judge was lame. And it was at that moment that I knew that Alan Eagleson was going to go down. The judge finds that Eagleson demonstrated an ability to mislead and lie. He orders him to give the Gillises their money back and pay their court costs. By now, the law is closing in on Eagleson from all sides. The RCMP has laid criminal charges. And in the United States, he faces 33 counts of fraud and racketeering. On January 7, 1998, Eagleson pleads guilty in a plea bargain. He's sentenced to serve 18 months. With his downfall will come the end of the almost feudal system that had kept players powerless for decades. The Hockey Hall of Fame, where the game's most brilliant stars are honored. Alan Eagleson was inducted in 1989. 
But now he's in jail, and along with the sentence comes disgrace. He's stripped of his Order of Canada, and finally, the ultimate censure for the self-made hockey kingpin, he's banished from the Hall of Fame. Nineteen ninety. The start of a decade in which Canada will have its first female prime minister and its first woman in space. But in the world of international hockey, women are still a novelty act. When France Saint Louis and her teammates arrive in their dressing room before the first ever women's world championship. They're greeted with a surprise, a brand new uniform, especially designed for the series. When we saw the pink and white, we couldn't believe it. We said, no way, we're not gonna wear that because we're girls. The men, men's team, they were wearing red and white, so we were hoping that we would wear the same color. What they explained to us was to bring the media at the rink. Pretty pink uniforms, beauty makeovers as door prizes, you'd think that women playing serious hockey was a next to impossible sell. Salary with the open net. But under the radar of hockey's establishment, the women's game has been growing strong. France Saint-Louis is one of its brightest stars. Her love of hockey started early. She practiced on her neighborhood rink in Montreal long after everyone else had gone home. I took my father's skates. They were so big for me, but it didn't matter. I couldn't believe there was no uh, picks at the end, and I was going crazy. We didn't have any girls hockey team, nothing. So the only place I could play was uh, outside. It was late because usually I was waiting until probably 10.30 at night to go outside, and uh, it was wonderful. Her devotion to the game keeps her going through all the years when ice time and money for women's teams are scarce. She funds her hockey career with money she earns as a teacher. I coached Francine Louis for 10 years, and I often say that she was the artist player to coach because she was so demanding on herself and, and others as well. For her, hockey was, was, you need to get better. But I don't think I'm never gonna meet another hockey player with, with this passion. Like, uh, she remind me of the Rocket Richard. Around to Saint Louis, loves those corners, and she comes out with it. The Pink Ladies, with Saint Louis playing center, win the first world championship. The next year, registration for women's amateur hockey goes up 40%. It seems that women's hockey has finally arrived. So when Phil Esposito, the general manager of the Tampa Bay Lightning, invites Manon Rayom to his NHL training camp, it's anything but a publicity stunt for her. At that point, I didn't care why they didn't invite me. If someone invite me because I'm a girl, who cares? I'm going. I needed to do it just so I can live with myself and know that I did everything in that sport to make it as far as I can. Imagine a frozen disc of vulcanized rubber hurtling straight at you at 145 kilometers an hour. The average speed of an NHL slap shot. Imagine 200-pound players crashing the net at speeds of up to 40 kilometers an hour. People ask me, why are you a goaltender? Are you crazy? 
I cannot describe it. I guess you have to be a goaltender. You just get into a groove. The feeling you get when you make a save, it's a great feeling. It's the same feeling that a player scoring a goal, but you get it over and over and over again. After her one NHL appearance, she lets in two goals but makes some good saves. Manon plays pro in the American minors, still the only woman paid to play against men. And she joins France Saint Louis on the Canadian Women's World Championship team. Saint Louis is captain and den mother of an extraordinary collection of talent, including a 15 year old prodigy named Haley Wickenheiser. She calls France mom. France calls her high chair. The team now wears red. It will dominate women's hockey in the 90s, winning four more world championships in a row. But France Saint Louis now sets her sights on something else. For the first time, women's hockey will be an official Olympic sport at the 1998 Games in Nagano, Japan. Saint Louis is now 39, usually too old for a national team. For almost a year, she trains mercilessly. That day when they told us if we were going to make the team, that was the longest day of my life. I can remember myself sitting in that uh, little uh, waiting uh, place before I go to that uh, office. So finally, it was positive and... Uh, Congratulations. It was uh, probably the best day of my life. As the men's and women's hockey teams arrive in Nagano, expectations are sky high. The women have never lost a world championship. And for the first time, the men's team will include Canada's top professionals. No more excuses. Ever since we stopped winning everything in the 50s, there was always kind of, well, of course, we couldn't win that tournament because we didn't have our best players there. Or we couldn't win that, that tournament because it was at the wrong time of year. In September, our guys aren't in shape. They're just getting in shape. They couldn't beat these guys. But here you've got the biggest stage. It's the number one stage. And everybody's there and they're gonna be in peak form, they're gonna be in game shape, and everything's equal. And if everything's equal, we're supposed to win because we're Canadians. Here come the Canadians, led by Manon Rayom. Tonight, she gets the start for Canada in the first ever Olympic gold medal in women's hockey. Oh, what a save! Manon Rayom plays brilliantly in net, keeping the Canadian team alive. Rayom, who has saved the day again. But Saint Louis and Wickenheiser can't get past a tough defense. Now a chance for Wickenheiser. Two on two. It's over. The team loses the gold medal match to the Americans. All I can remember is I'm crying. I'm looking beside, the, everybody's crying. We don't even, we can't look at them in front, you know, like. Mm. It's just what happened, you know? It's just that feeling that, what did we do wrong? And we lost the biggest game, you know, in our lives. The expectation was, was to win gold, there was nothing else. Some players did not want to come back. They were ashamed having this silver medal around their neck, and they were ashamed to come back to their own country, saying, well, could we go back? We, we failed. Uh, we couldn't produce. We couldn't get this first ever gold medal. Buck is at center ice. Oh, my goodness, the drama here in Japan. For Canada, the hurt is about to get worse. No. One nothing, 
Czechoslovakia. Over a million Canadians are up in the middle of the night to watch the final shootout in a men's game against the Czech Republic. So Brendan Shanahan can tie it for Canada off the post. The Czechs are ahead. This is Canada's last chance to score and stay in the game. Shanahan has got to bag this one. He's the fifth. He's got to score. That's all. No, he cannot do it. The Czech Republic will play for the gold medal. Riding the coattails of Dominic Hasek. So many hopes dashed. A nation goes into mourning. In the spring of 1999, fans in Canada and the United States give Wayne Gretzky standing ovations. He's been a New York Ranger for the past three seasons. Fans know this is the last time they'll see the great one in action. The player who redefined the game says goodbye after 20 seasons in which he dominated the NHL unlike any player in history. With Gretzky going, hockey's bid for big time status as a US sport will stall. And Canadians, Gretzky included, will begin to search for a way to reclaim their game.